All right. Now the part of the chapter we're going to be focusing on here in Ephesians chapter 1 is in the beginning part where it talks about the, you know, being predestinated and, um, you know, according to the good pleasure of God's will. And there's this concept here being taught of, um, you know, this predest predestination and God understanding who is going to be saved in advance. And there's a lot of people get confused about this doctrine. You know, the, what mainly I'm going to be focused on is, is the way that it's interpreted by a Calvinist. You know, John Calvin came up with, with his view on, on this type of doctrine, and it really spreads, you know, he came up with, someone came up with this, I don't think John Calvin actually did, but came up with the Ackerman Tulip to describe all of the different points, the five different points of his, of his belief system and of that doctrine. And I'm not, I've covered all of that in, in sermons in the past. I'm not going to go through every point tonight. I'm going to be dealing more specifically about us having a will. The fact that mankind has a free will, that God has ingrained in us a will that is our own, that is given to us by God, but we actually do choose things on our own and whether or not you go to heaven or hell can come down to what you choose. That it's not God up in heaven that just decides and picks and chooses and says, you're saved, you're not saved, arbitrarily by the sovereignty of God is what they'll say. Just saying, just kind of figuring out, you know, I, and they'll use verses like this to say God already determined it in the past. That it's already been pre-planned. That basically everything that we do has already been determined by God that all these things are going to be done. And that, and, and essentially what it boils down to, when you take Calvinism to its, to its logical end, is hyper-Calvinism. Which, you know, I mean, these are all different names. If you're not familiar with it, don't worry about it too much with the, with the terminology. But ultimately what hyper-Calvinism is, and, and it's just the logical extension of Calvinism. It's when you just take it all the way through, it turns people more into robots and into just being puppets on a string than individuals that God has given free will to. So we're going to start off here and look at some of these verses in Ephesians chapter 1. We're also going to be looking at Romans 8, which is another uh, a popular passage that people want to turn to. And I think Christians these days, this day, you know, in this time and, and many times probably get confused over this doctrine. So hopefully we'll shed some light on it. We've got plenty of, of scripture, though, that will um, testify of us having free will. And we're going to see those scriptures also. And just a little bit note, as we get started into this study, any doctrine that you come across, you obviously, first of all, you've got to take it in the whole context of the Bible. But when you find some statements in the Bible that maybe throw you for a loop and you're like, I don't know what this is saying. This sounds kind of weird. What does he mean by this? And it might be a little bit more difficult passage. If it seems to contradict like other parts of the Bible, you know you're not understanding something right. Because God's word inherently does not contradict itself. Otherwise, it's not coming from God. Because God is not um, foolish enough or stu too stupid to, to make everything fit together just fine and perfectly without, without having to say two different things. Now, the big thing with this is you're going to see plenty of evidence, plenty of scripture showing you explicitly that God has given us a will, that we have a choice, that it's up to us to make these choices. So when you see amount of, of evidence, or you see plenty of evidence on one side and a couple other things that, that might sound a little funny, you can pretty much trust that what, you know, when you see a whole bunch of scripture that that's correct. For example, so many, you know, the Mormons and other people like to turn to James chapter 2 to prove a works-based salvation. Now, <laughs> you could go on and I could preach for an hour of just quoting scripture that explains that we have eternal life, it's everlasting life, that it's by grace through faith, that it, you know, about the salvation, that it's completely not of works, as any man should boast. An extremely clear verse is very straightforward. But what people want to do then is turn to James chapter 2 and say, oh, well, it says faith without works is dead. And they'll, and they'll, and they'll show the, the question of, oh, well, if a man say that he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? And they'll say, see, see, you have to have works too. And, you know, and they go to a, a scripture like that, which 
I'll admit can be a little bit more tough to, you know, a little bit harder to understand, especially for younger Christians when you're, when you're first going through the Bible. I have no problems with that passage at all. No, I mean, I completely understand it 100% perfectly, and it fits in just fine with the rest of the Bible. There's not an issue there. There's no contradiction because he's not saying that you need works in order to be saved. But that's just an example of, what we, of the way that we need to study this. You know, if you look through and you're seeing verse after verse after verse that's explicit saying salvation is not of works, and then you finally get to James 2 and you're like, oh, that's kind of weird. What does that mean? Don't just throw out all of the evidence saying that it's not of works because you find one question in the Bible and you're like, oh, I don't know what that means. It's the same way when it comes to this Calvinistic doctrine that will teach that essentially we don't have a will because it's already been determined who is going to be saved and who's not going to be saved and God has chosen those people. We're going to start reading now in Ephesians chapter 1 and we'll get into the subject here. Verse number 4, the Bible reads, According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. And again, I'm not saying that what the Bible says is false in any way, shape, or form. What the Bible says is true. So we see here in this very first verse that we're looking at, verse 4, has God chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world? Yes. Yes, He has. But does that mean, you know, and, and see, this is where you got to be careful. It's when you start extrapolating and going beyond what the Scripture actually says when you could get into some trouble. Does it say that, he chose us before the foundation of the world, and then He chose other people to be damned just because He felt like it. No. There is a, there's a choosing here, but, but bear with me. Let's keep reading a little bit more. Verse number 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. And notice this last phrase. According to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So God has made us, here we see two, two phrases, he's chosen us before the foundation of the world, so before anyone is even born, he's saying, you know what, he's chosen us, and he has um, predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. But the phrase there at the end, according to the good pleasure of his will, is very important. Keep that in mind. Now, before we get out away from Ephesians 1, let's jump down to verse number 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Again, we're seeing references to the will of God. God's will. It's what he wants. According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ." So we see throughout this passage, especially the, the portions that are specifically talking about a predestination or an election, you know, it, it's always according to His will. It's according to God's will. Now the good thing is, is that God's will is not just unknown to us. They even said right here that He has made known unto us the mystery of His will. So God has made clearly known unto the apostles, unto the disciples, what His will is. And they are transmitting that unto us, especially in the New Testament. What is God's will? Well, we have verses like in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Bible reads, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when we're looking at these scriptures and saying, well, it's according to God's will, it's according to God's will, and then you see in 2 Peter chapter 3, well, it's not God's will that any should perish. God doesn't want anybody to die and go to hell. God would, God would, God wants that everybody would come to repentance and be saved. That is God's will. That is what God wants. In, second, uh, or in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
Verse 3, the Bible reads, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Again, God will have all men to be saved. It's God desired for everybody to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. God's desire, God's will is that everybody would be saved. We can say, well then how does this fit? How does this work? If that's God's will... But he says, well, he's predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Yes, that is what God predetermined. That's what he wants for us to do. That is, that is the plan that God has set for us. He's saying, I'm creating man, and his, his predestination for us is what he wants for us to do. The end point for, our, for us is to be in Christ. That's what he wants for us. That's what he wants for every man. That's what he's determined. But it doesn't say that he is making us or forcing us to do it one way or the other. But that is his plan for us. God's got a plan for all of your lives in this room, by the way. God's got a plan for every single one of you. But just because he has a plan, just because he has a map down in his head of what he wants you to do and how he wants you to serve him, doesn't mean he's going to make you do that. There is a best plan for your life. We don't always follow that best plan. The good thing is, is that God can make a plan B for your life also, even after you screw up. But it is God's will, according to the good pleasure of His will, He wants us to be adopted children of Jesus Christ. And there is no contradiction. See, the, the problem comes in is when you really start focusing in on these words, like predestined. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean just God just automatically sealed our fate before the world began of just saying, well, you are going to be saved? And, and he has just made that happen? No. He's given us the opportunity. Now, another thing that, that people get confused about is the fact that because God has a foreknowledge, it doesn't mean that he makes you do something. Okay? God, God you know, understanding God is, is, is kind of difficult in general for, for our human capacity minds to understand. We understand time. We understand space. We understand these things because we're in this system that we're bound by these, these laws. Understanding our own consciousness, but understanding a God who's outside of all of that, it's difficult. It's difficult to comprehend. And this is where a lot of the doctrine, the false doctrine comes from. I've noticed in my experience of dealing with people who are very Calvinistic in their belief, tend to be intelligent people in this world, just in general. I, I, you know, I can think of people, I'm not going to name any names, but people personally in my life that are very, very, very intelligent, very smart when it comes to a lot of different things. They're very analytical. They think about things a lot. But what I think happens is they start going into this realm of, of God being outside of time and thinking, well, he's the one who created us and... If he made me this a certain way, then even all of the decisions I make through my life is still a result of how God made me. And it starts getting real, you know, you start thinking about it, start getting real deep, and then they get into this notion of, well, that just must be the way that God made me then, and that's, you know, I'm doing all the things that he had already predetermined that I'm going to do. And they get into this. See, when you start thinking this way, you're, you're stepping away from Scripture and you start just making up this logical train of, of thought. But it's not, the end result is not consistent with the rest of Scripture. So, yeah, it may be a fun exercise to think about these things. I like thinking about those things. I think it's kind of interesting. It's kind of neat. Like, wow, all I know is a birth and a death, and you know, there's, there's, there's time in between, and we're continually in time. God's outside of that. God, God the things that happened 1,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and the things that are going to happen, you know, however far into the future, it, it, he's not part of that. He knows the beginning from the end already. He knows it all. I mean, he's written it and given it down to us and proves that he knows it because of the prophecies that have all come true already, which is why we know we've got the right God. But to say that just because he knows certain things, 
doesn't mean that, that you have to do it. So we know that, for example, you can look at something where we know the crucifixion, crucifixion of Jesus Christ had to happen. We know it was going to happen. Okay? God knew who was going to betray Jesus in advance. God knew the way things are going to play out in advance because he's God and he knows everything. But that doesn't mean that God made Judas Iscariot betray Jesus Christ and, and do that. He knew that he would choose to do those things, but it doesn't mean that he it removes his own free will to do the things that he chose to do. Now, I know I'm so, you know, try to stay with me because I, I don't want to get too deep on some of these things and, and get real boring on you, but this is an important topic. We really need to try to understand what the Bible is saying here when it says that, well, hey, he's predestined us after the counsel of his own will. When we see what God's will is very clearly, I mean, those are clear statements that God's not willing that any should perish. It's a clear statement that God will have all men to be saved. Those are very clear. That's stating exactly what God wants. He wants everyone to be saved and go to heaven, but that's not going to be the way that it is because it's up to us whether or not we're going to put our faith in Jesus Christ. John 3, uh, 12, verse 32 says, Jesus Christ said this, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, was Jesus Christ lifted up from the earth? Yes, he was. He was nailed to that cross. He was lifted up from the earth because that's what he was referring to. And he says, if that happens, I'm going to draw all men unto me. He draws all men. See, one of the doctrines of the Calvinist doctrine with this, you know, that I'm kind of preaching against tonight is they, they have the, the, the eye of the tulip is called irresistible grace, where... God's grace that he's bestowing upon you when he draws you, when he calls you, is completely irresistible so that you have no way of denying that. Like if, 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 if he's pulling on you, calling you, then because God's sovereign, you're automatically going to, to believe and, and be a part of that. That is false. And I've got plenty of uh, a scripture. I'm going a little bit out of order here. But, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with my order. We're going to get to that a little bit later where uh, there's plenty of scripture to prove that that's false. But Jesus Christ himself said, first of all, he's going to draw all men unto him. Now, does, do all men believe on him? No. But is he drawing all men unto him? Yes, yes he is. Absolutely. Otherwise, John 12, 32 is incorrect. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read through a few more of these because there's plenty of evidence. As I said, there's plenty of evidence to understand what the Bible is teaching about this subject, but we need to take it as a whole. We need to take it as a collective and look at all these different verses that are saying the same thing about God and who He is and what He wants and putting that in light with Ephesians chapter 1 or with Romans chapter 8. In... Um, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10, the Bible reads, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So did Jesus Christ die for all men? Yes, he did. And again, one of the, the L is limited atonement. The Calvinist believes in limited atonement, that... that the, the atoning blood of Jesus Christ is limited to only a certain group of people. They say that, well, you know, it's only for the elect. It's only for those who God has chosen who get their sins forgiven because Christ only died for them. And they'll say when the Bible says all, it doesn't really mean all. Which, you know, you're, you're just... <laughs> when you make statements like that, you're just trying to cling to a man-made doctrine instead of just believing what the Bible says. Look, God's Word, it's not a kindergarten book, but it is written for the common man. It is not some huge puzzle and, and, and really extremely difficult language to just figure out what is he saying here. It, it, you know, no, he made it so that we could, we could understand it without having to have a theologian or a professor explain everything to us. That is not the way that God designed His Word to work. His Word is, is powerful. His Word is what gives you understanding. And, and you know what? He's given us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to help teach us also. So when God says um, He's the Savior of all men, it means He is the Savior of all men. Every man can be saved through the Savior, Jesus Christ, 
if they put their faith in him, if they believe on him. And that's why he's the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Because why are they special? Because they are saved. Because he is their savior and, and has saved them the moment they put their faith in Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus Christ died for, again, everybody's sins. These verses are very clear. I mean, is there any doubt in anyone's mind about what this scripture is saying that we're reading? Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's everybody. The entire world. 2 Peter 2 verse 1 reads, But there are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. This is talking about false prophets. People who are not saved. People who did not put their faith in Jesus Christ. But referring to, well, Jesus has still bought them. They've denied Christ who actually bought them. How? When he shed his blood for every man. When he died for the sins of the whole world. He's bought them, but they're not in Christ. Because they've rejected him. They don't believe on him. But they're still, you know, he still ended up dying on the cross for their sins. But it does no good unto them because they have not believed. It's not being imputed unto them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse number 14. That's where I had you turn, 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse number 14. The Bible reads, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And isn't that what we teach? Isn't that what people believe? Well, we're all dead through our sins, through our trespasses, through, through breaking God's laws. He says, well, if one died for all, which he did, Jesus Christ died for everybody, then we're all dead. We were all dead in our sins and trespasses. Verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Again, just, just verse after verse stating unequivocally that Jesus Christ died for everybody. Every single person. There's not, there's not certain groups of people that he singled out. Now turn, if you would, to um, Proverbs chapter 1. And I'm going to read for you from Joshua chapter 24. Even though I'm not going point by point through the Calvinistic doctrine, they all, they all have to go together in order to make any sense of their doctrine whatsoever. You need to have the total depravity of man. You need to have the, um, was it the unconditional grace, right? Unconditional. I thought, if you believe, you know, that's a condition. They believe in the limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the uh, pr uh, perseverance of the saints. We're not going to tackle them all individually, but they do go together, which is why we're starting to see here, you know, if God's picking and choosing certain people to be saved, that implies, well, then did Jesus die for everybody? I mean, if, he, if he's already determined way before Jesus ever came and died on the cross, like, well, why would he even be dying for the sins of people who God's already chosen to go to hell? I mean, that alone just doesn't make very much sense. Well, we see he's died for all men. It's very clear. It's, it's extremely evident in the Bible. You can't get around it. It's all throughout the New Testament that, that he's died for all men. Now we're going to see some elements in the Bible of us actually having a free will. We have a choice. We have a choice in the matter of whether or not we're going to get saved. Joshua 24, 14 says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. The choice is yours, Amen. is what he's saying. Hey, God's not making the choice for you. You decide. Who's the right God? Is it the gods of the Amorites? Is it the gods of Egypt? Or is it the Lord? He says, you know what? Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You choose who you're going to believe. 
The choice is up to you. We, he's given us that free will. Proverbs chapter 1, look at verse 28. The Bible reads, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. This is talking about God, and, and in context, we just went over this recently, how God's saying, you know what? I've called, and you didn't answer. I stretched out my hand, and no man regarded it. He's like, I've been calling you. I've been drawing you. I've been trying to tell you. I want you to get saved. But when you reject God, and it gets to this point in Proverbs 1 where he rejects you, he's saying, you know what? Then they're going to call me. I'm not going to listen. And why? It says because they hated knowledge. They heard the knowledge, but they hated it. They didn't want to hear anything to do with God, and they did not choose the fear that they had a choice. Everybody has a choice. It's up to us. We see that. And then in Revelation 22, you can flip back here if you want. It's, a, it's the last chapter of the whole Bible. Revelation 22, verse 17. It's one of the last verses in the entire Bible. When we're talking about being saved and the concept of a free will. I, I, was, I was out soul winning oh, probably about a year ago and I ran into a Calvinist and it was a, a real nice couple, a man and his wife. And, um, you know, I, I was having a good conversation with them. I was trying to get somewhere with them, but they were real heavily Calvinist. And um, the wife mentioned something. She said, well, you know, free, free will isn't mentioned anywhere in the Bible. She said, it's not mentioned one time. And I said, free will is mentioned many times in the Bible. Do you not read your Bible? Have you ever heard of a free will offering? Because the Old Testament goes on and on and on about the different offerings, and the free will offering is mentioned, I don't know how many times. I mean, I have to go and, and count them up. It's mentioned many times. The concept of a free will offering means that, you know, there are certain offerings, sin offerings, and, and uh, the, the Passover offering, and these other offerings, that was part of the law. You had to do those things. I mean, when you screw up with God, you have to go and bring your, your sacrifice and your offering to get right with God. Like, that was part of the law. God says, you have to do this. The free will offering, though, that was not a requirement. Free will means exactly that. It's your free will. Hey, do you want to... And he said, well, this is the way you do it. If you want to give an offering unto God, if you love God, you want to show God you're thankful, whatever, whatever the reason is, out of your own heart, out of your own will, this is how you do it, but go ahead and do it. No requirement. That's a free will offering. Because it's of your own will. Do you think God is up in heaven calling a free will offering free will and then going, <laughs> they think they have free will. I'm actually making him give me a free will offering. What kind of weird God would do that? I mean, that's, that's, it, it is. It's a different God, ultimately. The God of, uh, that Calvinism teaches is, is a different God. It's a weird God. And you know what the God of Calvinism is? It's a God that is choosing that people go out and molest children. It is a God that, that is sending these reprobates, serial killers, to go off and do heinous acts against other people. They're saying that that's of God. Because if God's controlling everything that you do, when it gets down to this hyper-Calvinist position of just, hey, God's sovereign, He controls everything. Everything's happening because God wants it that way. No, it's not. Everything does not happen because God wants it that way. Does God have power? Yes. Can God intercede in things that go on in this earth? Yes, he can. But is God just controlling every single one of your thoughts and every single one of your actions and just making you do like a robot everything that he wants you to do? No. How twisted is that to think about the kid that gets defiled? Oh, well, God wanted that to happen to him. No way did God want that to happen to him. Revelation 22, look at verse number 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Anybody that wants it, that will, it's up to you. It's your choice. Hey, do you want the water of life? It's yours. Put your faith in Christ. That's it. Done. It's up to you to want. It's up to you to choose it. Turn, if you would, now to Romans chapter 8. We're going to deal with some of the passages in Romans 8 and Romans 9. And here, you know, there, and I, I guess I didn't make this clear enough in the beginning as, I, as I'd wanted to. I brought up the James chapter 2 example with salvation. 
right? And saying, when you come across all of these scriptures that say one thing, and then you get to James chapter 2, you know, go with your mountain of evidence. Well, this, this concept of you know, predestination, predestination in, in one form or another occurs like four times in the Bible. In Ephesians 1 and in Romans chapter 8. Total. Because we saw it like twice in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to see it twice in Romans 8 and maybe Romans 9. But that's it. Like that is, that is all of the references with this word, with this, with this type of concept being brought forth. So it's not like it's all throughout the Bible. And if you're hearing somebody teach something that's, that's you know, using these words and, and making them mean more than what it actually is, because, and, and the, way, the reason why you know that is because it's, it's contradicting, for example, the concept of having free will, then don't go with it. And, and that's why I made some of the effort just to go through and say, look, it's free will. We get to choose. Choose you this day. You did not choose the fear of the Lord. Whosoever will him, take of the water of life freely. To, to say that, well, God has already predestinated us, but then he says whosoever will doesn't make any sense. Romans 8, let's look at verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things if God be for us, who can be against us? So we get a little bit more information here. He's saying, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. predestinate. So if you want to use that, that concept of, well, God has predetermined that you do this, well, he's doing this for who he already foreknew. Which, having the foreknowledge of what people are going to do. For example, you know, God knew the choices that I would make in my life before I was ever born. He knew at the foundation of the world. I didn't exist. We're, we're in this time frame. But because he knew that I would, when I was 20 years old, put my faith in Jesus Christ, he's saying, you know what? I predestinated that you be conformed unto the image of my son. He already knew that. He already knew what I was going to choose. But it doesn't mean he made me make the decision. There's a big distinction there to be made. Knowing something in advance doesn't mean you're causing it to happen. And setting you up and, and having a plan for your life then of, of a predestination. You know, this is where I want you to be. And ultimately, I will be conformed to the image of his son when... I lose this flesh and I get my new body and that's in the image of Jesus Christ. Just like every believer will have that. Look at, turn if you would to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because we also saw this, this concept of being called coming up multiple times in Romans 8. I'll just read it again for you. It says, To them who are the called according to his purpose, when it says all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. And it says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. We're going to see here that that calling is actually going out to everybody. God's calling. Verse number uh, 9 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 the Bible reads, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And this is talking about people who decided they chose not to receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They've already made that decision. So once they've decided, you know what? 
I'm not going to receive the truth. Then God starts making him believe in lies. You say, okay, well, you didn't want it, so here you go. And, and, and this is at the time, of course, of the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you read the whole thing in context. That's what it's talking about. God sending a strong delusion for the people that rejected Christ to believe a lie. It says that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 13, you're going to see there again a reference saying, well, God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. If you just stop there, he's chosen you to salvation. Well, what type of salvation? He's chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. You can't leave the rest of that verse out because what he's saying is he's chosen for you that you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's chosen that for everybody, that this is the way that you get saved. From the beginning, he's chosen for you to believe on Jesus Christ. But he hasn't made you do it. And it says, whereunto he called you by our gospel. The gospel is what calls you to salvation. The gospel is, it was commanded to be preached to every creature. So if, he's, if, he's, if Jesus Christ is saying, preach the gospel to everybody, then the call is going out to everybody. That is the gospel call, and that is what we need to receive in order to be saved. You could either receive it or you could reject it. If you reject it, you know what? God has still called you, but you refused. And that's, again, the wording of Proverbs chapter 1. Hey, I've called, but you refused. Turn if you to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. There's so much to get into with this type of a doctrine because it impacts so many areas. I'm going to try to keep it relatively simple tonight, and, and hopefully I'm, not, uh, I'm making things a little bit more clear for you and not, not uh, muddying it up uh, any further. Romans chapter 9, look at verse number 7. Romans 9, 7 reads, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. And see, this is one of the key texts that people will go to to try to prove that, see, God is just choosing automatically, arbitrarily, by whatever reason he wants to give, to just say, I love this person, I hate this person. In verse number um, 13, it says, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So let's say, see, it says while they were in the, the children, while they were in their mother's womb, they haven't done anything good, they haven't done anything evil, and it's saying that God has just chosen this. And that's not what the scripture is saying. That's what they're saying, it says. They're saying, turn to see, they haven't done anything good or bad, but God is just deciding that he's hating one person and loving another person. That is not what the scripture is teaching at all. The Bible says here that the elder shall serve the younger. Now, it does say that the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. He says the elder shall serve the younger. This was prophesied that that was going to be the case. Again, God has foreknowledge of events. God knows what's going to happen. God knows the choices that people are going to make. So when he makes a prophecy and says something like this, it's not that the elder shall serve the younger made that happen. It's that it was, it was, it was prophetically spoken because God already knew that that was going to be the case and the choices that Esau would make versus Jacob. And when it says, as is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, when it says, as it is written, if you really want to understand what it's talking about, go back to the, to the reference that it's, that, that's coming from in the Old Testament. Because when you do that here, let's go back to Malachi chapter 1. Keep your finger here in Romans 9. We're coming back to it. 
I actually wasn't planning on going through this, but, but we've gotten into it already, and it's, imp it's an important point. Malachi chapter 1 is where this is quoted from. When he says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Without knowing the reference, you might look at that and say, wow, God just chose to, to hate Esau for no reason, and he loved Jacob. As individuals, right? As the person, the person Jacob and the person Esau. But is that really the case? I mean, do we even see that? When you go back to Genesis and you read the story of Jacob and Esau, and even throughout time, wasn't God saying, you know what? No, that's Esau's land, right? That, that they weren't able to take over the land that Esau had. They had the other people's you know, wicked land to take over, but not Esau. He said, nope, that's your brother. You, know, you leave him, have his inheritance, and, and everything else. But what is he talking about here? Look at Malachi chapter 1. Verse number one, the Bible reads, the burden, of the, word, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. Look at this. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. But we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Now, he, he goes back here and says, I love Jacob and hated Esau. That was where the quote was from. But he goes on further to say that his heritage was waste. It's the descendants, it's the people that came after him. And he references Esau as in verse 4, whereas Edom saith. Now, Edom is not the man Esau. That's what the, the Edomites are the descendants. It's the people who, who were uh, generated from Esau. It's, it's all of his descendants for, for you know, years and years after Esau himself as a man lived on this earth. It's the Edomites. And he's saying that, you know what, when they go to try to rebuild the desolate places, the places that God's already you know, judged them for because they're being wicked, that God is going to um, throw down whatever they build and he's not going to let their work prosper. And the reason is because of their own wickedness. But this is referring to an entire nation, entire group of people, not the individual Esau. Just like it wasn't the individual Jacob either. I mean, Jacob is Israel, right? Who, who um, of course, we know the 12 tribes of Israel and everything else that comes after him. He loved Jacob and he hated Esau, but it wasn't for their individual things that they've done. It's, it, it was the people that were coming after them. And in Malachi chapter 1, we could see that context where he's referring to Edom. Flip back, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. I wanted to point that out because there's another point to be made here that we're going to see in Romans chapter 9 in a little bit as we keep reading here. <clears throat> Verse number 14 says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And again, now we're, we're referring to God's will, right? And it's saying that, well, God, and what they'll say is that, well, see, God could do whatever he wants to do. Whatever it is that God wants to do, if he wants to harden this person, he could harden their heart. If he doesn't want to harden their heart, he doesn't, you know, he, he's not going to harden their heart. But that's not exactly what happens, and especially he uses the example of Pharaoh, I'm going to read for you. You can turn if you want. Go back to Exodus chapter 5. I'm going to kind of blow through a lot of these, these references. We're going to see what happens with Pharaoh and how the hardening of his heart occurs. Because he is the example here that's given in Romans chapter 9 of, well, God has mercy on whom he has mercy and whom he will he hardeneth, right? And we're going to find that this example of what happens with Pharaoh is consistent, again, throughout all of Scripture on how a person's heart is hardened by God. 
Because it's not just arbitrary. It's not just, well, here's this Pharaoh guy. He's living his life. He's doing his own thing. And, and, he, and you know, no big deal. And I'm just going to harden his heart. That's not the way God operates. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to see here when Moses and Aaron first confront Pharaoh. We're going to see what his attitude's like. Look at verse number 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So right off the bat, this is before any hardening of any heart is, is spoken of in the Bible referring to Pharaoh. He's just saying, you know, who is God? I don't know any God, you know, like, I, I don't know the Lord. I'm not going to obey his voice. I'm not going to let you go. Immediately just resisting. Now, as you read these chapters, flip over your to chapter 8. As you go through these chapters, you're going to find different uh, references of in some cases, you can't tell who's doing the hardening. It says, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Well, when it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened, was God hardening it or was Pharaoh hardening it? You can't tell. But in, we're going to look at some of the places where Pharaoh starts off hardening his own heart. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 13, the Bible reads, And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. So as these plagues are happening, this is the plague of the frogs. It says in verse 14, And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart, and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So we see Pharaoh hardening his own heart. He sees the miracles. He sees what's going on. He sees the plagues. He knows it's from God. That's what Moses is telling him. But he hardens his own heart. He's, he's saying, no. I'm still not going to let you go. He hardens his own heart. Verse 31, jump down to 8, uh, Exodus 8, 31. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies. So again, another plague. The other one was the frogs, this one's the flies. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh and from his servants and from his people. There remained not one, and Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. Again, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Now, when you go back and study this, just for full disclosure, because we're not going to every single reference, you will see mixed in there God hardening Pharaoh's heart. But we still see Pharaoh having an opportunity here to not harden his own heart. He has the ability at this point, because he hardens his own heart, to say, you know what? You're right. You know, God must be the true Lord. And, and I've seen enough. Go ahead and worship God. He's had the opportunity up to this point because he's hardening his own heart. He's still being stiff-necked and refusing to hear what Pharaoh has or what uh, God has to say. Flip over to chapter 9. We see another example. Exodus chapter 9, verse 33. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands unto the Lord and the thunders <coughs> and hail ceased and the rain was not poured upon the earth. Another plague, a different plague. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart, he and his servants. We see multiple times plagues happening and Pharaoh hardening his heart, hardening his heart, sinning and saying, nope, it's not God. I'm not, you know, not going to believe it. And then it gets to the point in Exodus 10, in, uh, you can turn there if you like since you're already in Exodus. Exodus 10, verse 1 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these my signs before him. Verse 20 says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And verse 27 says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. And in chapter 11, verse 10, the Bible reads, And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. It got to the point to where God just finally said, I'm done, now I'm hardening your heart. See, Pharaoh had an opportunity for a long time to do what was right. And he hardened his own heart. And see, this is the way that God works. And this goes a little bit into the reprobate doctrine, which I don't really want to spend too much time on tonight. But God, this is the way that God works. 
that he operates. He says, I gave you this opportunity. I'm calling unto you. I've, I've given you a chance. I, I want you to be saved. I want you to be saved. Jesus Christ died for everybody. You, you know, their salvation is available, but at some point, when you harden your own heart, when you're stiff-necked, when you reject the Word of God, when you don't like to retain God in your own knowledge, God says, fine. I'm done. I'm hardening your heart now. But that is not what God intended or wanted from the beginning of the, of the creation. Amen. That is not, was not God's desire to do it. Now, will God do that? Yes, He will. And at that point, from that point on, what He does is He removes actually a portion of your free will because you no longer are capable of believing on Jesus Christ. You cannot believe once God has hardened your heart. But up until that point, just like the moment you die, your free will is gone to choose to believe on Jesus Christ. I mean, your, your time ran out. When you harden your heart, harden your heart, and God finally says, you know what? I'm hardening your heart for you. I'm done with it. And now I'm just going to let you continue to refuse because I'm really going to show you how powerful I am. That is not God's plan from the beginning. God did not hate Pharaoh from the beginning of the foundation of the world of, um, you know, or at least, you know, prior to his existence, you know, prior to his decision where he rejected God. There was a love there which changed to hate. Psalm 95. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 95. <clears throat> we have the choice to harden our own hearts. We have the will to do so. Psalm 95, look at verse number 8. Psalm 95, verse 8. The Bible reads, is a warning. Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. So he's saying, look, don't harden your heart like the children of Israel did back in the wilderness. He says in, in the provocation, when the children of Israel provoked the Lord, when they provoked God to anger, when they, when they did things and God just said, you know, I've had enough. It says in verse 9, When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And in another place it explains that, you know, why did that enter his rest? It's to them that believed not. And see, when we put our faith in Christ, we enter into God's rest. It's the rest from our own works. It's the finished work of Christ. That's the rest that we receive in salvation through Christ. But the people that harden their heart, and these are people that saw and witnessed you know, all the miracles of God. When God led them forth out of Egypt, when God, you know, when Moses split the Red Sea, and they crossed over on dry, dry ground. They knew that that was of God. All of these amazing miracles and God setting them free, all the plagues that they witnessed with their own eyes, everything that they saw, and they still tried, tempted, and proved God and just said, you know what? They, they still refused to believe. And he says, you're not entering in the promised land now. I've had it with you. I mean, I've given you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to get things right. I've heard you complaining. I've heard you murmuring. And now what? I've had it. You've seen what I'm capable of and you still refuse to believe you're not entering into my rest. You're not entering into the promised land. You're going to die in the wilderness. And that's what's being taught here. And that's why he's saying don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. Romans 9, 19, and this is where they get the irresistible grace from. It says, uh, Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And that's going back to, uh, well, let's go back, to, yeah, go back if you would to Romans 9. We'll get that in more context. Go back to Romans 9. I'll read a little bit more context for you before I, I refute the irresistible grace aspect. <clears throat> Let's read from, um, yeah, because he's talking about Pharaoh. Verse 17, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. 
Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall a thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the power, potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? And what they'll say is, Well, see, Pharaoh, like they're saying, How can, how can you find fault with Pharaoh? Because how can he even resist the will of God? If it's God's will, that, and this is what, again, what the Calvinists will say, if it's God's will that, that his power be made known through Pharaoh, then how can Pharaoh be at fault? Well, Pharaoh is at fault because he hardened his own heart before God ultimately hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And it says, Who hath resisted the, his will? God's will? Well, Acts 7.51 says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So is that irresistible? No. There's grace there, but it's, it's not irresistible grace. There's a grace that is being resisted. Right. He's resisting, um, you know, people resisting the Holy Ghost as their fathers did, so do ye. 2 Timothy 3.8 says also, Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. These reprobates of Jannes and Jambres, they resisted the truth. They resisted God's will. They resist the Holy Ghost. They're resisting it. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They've resisted and it's recorded in Scripture that there are people that, that do resist um, the, the calling of God. Let's go back to Romans 9 here. Let's keep reading. We'll finish up. We're almost done. We're going to finish off the rest of these verses. Verse 21, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Ozi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. There are a few chapters, and we, and we read you know, Romans 8, Romans 9, Ephesians 1. When you get someone else's view in your head, sometimes it can be hard to, to see it differently than, than what they've already presented to you. So when someone gives you a Calvinistic interpretation of, of the predestination and being called and being elect, it, it, it's hard to look at those sometimes the way that it's actually written. But... We see from the, the context of the entire Bible, we see from what we know about God, what we know about God's will, God's not willing that any should perish, what God wants for us in this life, that God actually is a long-suffering, merciful God that really wants everyone to be saved. Understanding that and knowing that, to think that we don't really have a will, that God has picked and, cho and chosen just already from the beginning, you're saved, you're not saved, doesn't make any sense, it doesn't add up. Right. So we got to be careful with, 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 you know, when people try to, try to teach that because it's false. But when you read this, you know, it's, it's, I think the best way to understand it is what I've already mentioned. Foreknowing something doesn't mean you're causing it to happen. I could see my child standing up on a chair and leaning over and leaning over. I could know in advance that they're going to fall on the ground. It doesn't mean that I'm making them do that. Right? You could know because we know the, 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 um, the cause and effect. Right? You could see things happen. We have enough experience and have enough wisdom, enough knowledge to know that. God has enough wisdom and knowledge to see outside of time and to see the, the beginning from the end. But it doesn't mean he made it be that way. Did God make you who you are? Yes. But God has given us this awesome gift of a free will. And... I'm going to close with this point and why it makes so much sense. 
God wants us to praise him. God wa we know this about God. God wants no other gods before him. He wants our attention. He wants us relying on him. He wants us going to him in prayer. He wants our affection and our attention and our care. He wants us to put him first. He wants to get the first fruits. God desires that from his creation. He wants that from us. But what he did not do was create a robot to just give him that affection. What, the, the reason why he gave us his free will, what I, one of the reasons I believe, is you know, he made us for his pleasure. That's why we're, we are and we're created. Think about this. How much pleasure would you get from your own creation? You build a robot. You build a little cyborg. And you pre-program it to just say, Oh... Pastor Burzins, you're so wonderful. You are the best man on the earth and just give you praise and all the other stuff. Knowing that I, just, I already programmed it to do that. Right. Like, it's not choosing whether or not to, to show any affection toward me. It's just doing exactly what I pre-programmed it to do and it has no option to do anything other than that. That is very empty. That is very vain. That is very hollow. But then you take a creation and say, you can choose. Whatever You could hate me. You could love me. And then the creation chooses to love you. That's a great feel. I mean, that, that is a great fulfillment. That is a great joy that comes from that. I mean, you think of your own children, right? Do your children have to love you? No. Are they pre-programmed that they just must love you? No. They don't have to. But when they do, there's great joy in that. And that's how God created us. He's given us a will. He's given us the freedom. He's given us the choice and says, it's up to you. You don't have to love me. You don't have to serve me. You don't have to obey me. Now, there's consequences for our actions. He's created hell. So this is the way it's going to be. But he wants us to serve him out of a loving heart, out of our own will and our own desire. And that's a gift that he's given to us. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great gift of the will that you've given us, dear Lord. Um, it truly is a, an amazing gift. You've, you've allowed us to basically have our own fate in our own hands by, by choosing what we're going to do, what we're going to believe, and, and where our faith is going to lie, dear Lord. We thank you for making salvation so simple. We thank you for loving the world so much that you decided that you would offer up your only begotten Son on the cross to die for our sins, dear Lord. We love you for that, and we thank you for loving us so much and giving us so many opportunities, dear Lord, to come to you. And I pray that you would please help us to reach people that may have rejected you in the past, dear Lord, but that have not uh, had their hearts hardened by you. Help us to reach those people before they get to that point so that we can explain to the best of our abilities, dear Lord, the, the free gift of salvation that's available to them, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.